Okay, so just as an introduction, as was mentioned, my name is Nina Freeman. Uh, I'm a level designer right now at Fulbright, working on their current project, Tacoma. Um, and in my personal work, I'm interested in making autobiographical vignette games. Um, and a vignette is a short account or brief description of something, if you're not familiar. Um, and I'm particularly interested in portrait style vignettes um, that examine a particular character and their emotions during sort of a specific scenario. Um, so, for example, I worked on this game called How Do You Do It? Um, that's an autobiographical vignette game, uh, and it's a portrait of myself as a young girl basically banging dolls together to try and figure out how sex worked. Um, so I'll just play the game really quickly for you so you can see it, in case you haven't. Just pull it up. if I just leave it right here? Okay. So this vignette game, how do you do it, that I just showed you, uh, tries, I worked on it, by the way, with Emmett Butler, Deki Koss, and Joni Kataka, who are all awesome developers. Um, and so we made this game, and I, I wanted to make it to try and help players embody my young self, to try and like put them in my shoes as this young girl who was sort of like confused about what sex was. Um, so... As you saw in the game, you are able to control young Nina's arms and hands in order to like bang the dolls together. Um, and you know the rag doll physics of the dolls make it look pretty silly. Um, and I wanted to evoke the feeling of confusion and earnestness I remember feeling when playing sex with my dolls at that age. Um, so the clumsiness of the game and of like banging the dolls together and how they flop about, and she kind of pushes them together really quickly like she's nervous. These are all things that were meant to evoke that nervous excitement that I remember feeling. Um, so, because the whole thing is it's just about furtively playing in secret um, while my mom was out of the store. So I'm really interested in giving players these kinds of mechanics that help them better understand me and my feelings through these brief, true stories, like how do you do it? Um, and I want them to come away from the game with a sense that they kind of were the little girl for, for even just a moment. Um, so, this vignette game, um, let's see, oops, one sec, where, okay, yeah, so for these personal games, like, how do you do it, um, I usually, uh, draw from personal memories, um, as I mentioned before, and oftentimes, people ask me, like, how I decide, like, what, because, you know, I've lived a whole life, I have lots of memories, how do I pick single ones to make games about. Um, and I usually try and pick ones that I have really complex feelings about, memories that I don't feel like I fully understand yet, that I think I could 
like spend some time with to try and better understand as part of my process of designing the game. Um, and oftentimes these games that are about these complicated memories are very cathartic um, and help me cope with untangling these kind of emotional memories, um, whether they're very sad memories or kind of silly, funny memories, like how do you do it? There's still issues there that I was trying to, to work out. Um, for example, with how do you do it, when I was working on it, um, I was thinking a lot about how it was so confusing to grow up as a kid whose parents like didn't ever want to talk about sex. Like it was totally taboo to talk about in my house. So I kind of wanted, I'd never really like dealt with that or thought about it. So I was like, oh, I'll make this game and like, I don't know, maybe I'll show my parents and see what they say. Um, they didn't like it. <laughs> so I'm just going to run through with some other examples of like personal games that I've made or that I'm working on just to give you a better sense of what this whole body of work is like. So with my current project, Sybil, which this is a screenshot from, um, I'm trying to unwind the memory of my first time having sex, which is another complicated memory that I felt like, I mean, I'm still working on the game, so I guess I haven't fully dealt with it yet. Um, but in the game, uh, you play as me, forming a relationship with a guy in an online game, sort of like an MMORPG. Um, and you play this online game as me, uh, but you also interact with my computer, a la this desktop, um, going through my selfies and my files, uh, embodying my experience of forming a relationship on the internet um, through interacting with the system. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, so with another game uh, called Freshman Year, which this is a screenshot from, uh, just to sort of talk about another complex memory that I made a game about, I was trying to understand my feelings towards a harasser I encountered in college. Um, I had never really accepted the fact that I'd been assaulted, and making the game that relives this experience helped me deal with that memory and to try and understand why I felt so weird about it. Um, it helped me move on, essentially. So these ideas are all based on parts of my life that I still wanted to sit with and reflect on. Those kinds of stories always feel the most satisfying to me as a designer because they're stories I'm, I don't feel like I understand, so I can explore and learn about myself through the process of making the game. And I think that that often makes the game's story stronger. So all that said about making games about my personal memories, often ones that I don't understand and want to cope with, um, you might be wondering why I want to reveal the intimate details of my life in games. Because <laughs> even just sharing, I'm sure a lot of you can relate, even just sharing your personal stories with friends can be really scary. Talking about like love, sex, paranoia, illness, or anything considered private sphere or personal can make you feel vulnerable and self-conscious and even afraid. I have definitely felt all of these things while making autobiographical games. However, my fears are eclipsed by my desire to feel a connection with other people through these games. Making them helps me feel connected to people and to the world around me. I can't explain why I feel this connection through my games without telling you a little bit or like a lot <laughs> about my life and the story of how I started making games. Um, and even though I wasn't making games as a kid, it all kind of starts there. So why autobiographical games? I, when I was like really young, I grew up feeling emotionally isolated because um, my family was never really interested in talking about personal stuff. They were always fighting. Uh, I was the only child, so they would fight and I would get pushed aside during the conflicts because I was just the kid like getting in the middle of it. Um, I didn't have any other kids to hide in the backyard with when they fought, being the only one around. So I quickly learned uh, how to hide myself. I'd hide literally physically, like behind curtains, behind the couch, under the bed, in the attic, or in the bushes. I also learned to hide my feelings. It felt a lot better and safer than lashing out like I saw my family doing. This desire to hide myself stuck with me as I grew up. When we, my family, moved into a house when I was 12, I claimed the one upstairs room for myself and set up my computer there. It was the perfect hiding spot. No matter how much fighting was going on downstairs, I could put my headphones on and drown it out while I played games or watched anime. My hiding continued in high school. I had only a couple close friends, and I spent a lot of time in that computer room and at theater rehearsal, which I liked because I could play characters in these plays instead of being myself, and it felt less scary that way. 
it helped me avoid my internal teen drama and angst, which was too scary for me to talk about or share with other people because I was so used to hiding. So that's like childhood, high school, now college. So in college, I was lucky enough to meet uh, a professor North uh, who introduced me to poetry. I took his writing class during my first year and he encouraged me, telling me that my poems were good and that I should write more. Professor North always emphasized that there was beauty in details and that some of the best inspiration came from one's own life experience. Uh, so he very much believed in this and showed us work from poets who did that. So he showed me the work of poets who cared about personal stories and details like Frank O'Hara and Elizabeth Bishop. Um, and this poem by Ted Berrigan, who came a little later than those poets but follows in their footsteps, um, is a good example of that kind of personal work in poetry. So I'll read it to you. Uh, this is one of Ted Berrigan's sonnets. Um, I wake up back aching from soft bed, Pat gone to work, Ron to class. I never heard a sound. It's my birthday. I put on birthday pants, birthday shirt, go to Adam's, buy a Pepsi for breakfast, come home, drink it, take a pill, I'm high. I do three Greek lessons to make up for cutting class. I read birthday book from Joe on Juan Greece, real name Jose Vittoriano Gonzalez. Stop in the middle, read all my poems, gloat a little over new ballad, quickly skip old sonnets, imitations of Shakespeare. Back to books. I read poems by Auden, Spencer Pound, Stevens, and Frank O'Hara. I hate books. I wonder if Jan or Helen or Babe ever think about me. I wonder if Dave Bearden still dislikes me. I wonder if people talk about me secretly. I wonder if I'm too old. I wonder if I'm fooling myself about pills. I wonder what's in the icebox. I wonder if Ron or Pat bought any toilet paper this morning. So that's an autobiographical poem by Ted Perrigan that's done in the style of a vignette. Um, sort of, I, I, I would hope you can kind of see the similarity in the kinds of games I make talking about these little detailed experiences. I draw a lot from this kind of work um, in my own. So you can see it's recounting, this poem is recounting his feelings, Ted's, upon one particular birthday, referring to the specific details of that day and evoking a particular atmosphere about it through carefully chosen words, like the many I wonders at the end. It makes you wonder if he was feeling uncertain or uncomfortable about aging another year. I was drawn to these personal poems about small, ordinary life experiences because they were so raw. The poets weren't trying to paint a pretty picture of their lives. They were writing about love, anxiety, ecstasy, pain, hate. They expressed this huge spectrum of emotions just through writing about going to lunch with a friend or like walking through the park. So I thought I too could express my feelings through these brief vignette poems like I saw the poets doing, like Ted Berrigan. I took cues from these poets and tried to write honestly about the things I'd always needed to get off my chest. My relationships, heartbreak, sex, family turmoil, fear, and anxiety. It felt so powerful to finally share the stories I'd held secret for so long. Here's a page from one of my notebooks from like 2009 or something. Um, it was one of my first poetry notebooks that I kept. Um, poetry helped me learn to distill my stories into words so that I could better understand myself. Writing personal poetry was cathartic. It helped me vent, but it also helped me learn how to parse my feelings. It was my first real step towards learning how to connect with people. Because before I could feel connected, I had to have a better understanding of my own self, which poetry helped me do. It gave me, it, poetry, gave me the tools to help process all the things that I'd been holding inside for so long while I was hiding. I had a way of expressing myself honestly for the first time in my life. But I wasn't quite connected to people yet, because I was mostly writing for myself. So here's an example of the kind of poetry I was writing uh, that was helping me express myself and learn about myself. I wrote this shortly after my grandfather died when I was in college. I'll read you this poem, too, because I, I like reading poems. Uh, OK. The blunt tips of grass sheared by me smell tart, a sour candy unwrapped staining your tongue, the blueberry sharp scent matching denim overalls. Crawl space bush, a fort. Its leathery leaves are a summer sponge. Pigeons on the bricks fly away. Nanu stuck a penny into the cracked wall and no one will ever move it. The shadow in the copper stained wood. Old sweaters clipped onto the clothesline and eyelash arc. Annual blue rhododendron rises again. 
So I wrote poems like this about my grandfather and about a lot of other things, and they were very cathartic. But I didn't only write about sad stuff. I was also writing about party, sex, jokes, friendship, and everything else. I wrote a lot of poems about parties and sex. Uh, poetry helped me understand and distill my life in all ways. It's important to reflect upon the good and the bad, you know? I had just never thought this deeply about my life, and it was empowering to be able to write my feelings down on paper in a form that I could hand to other people and say, read this, this is what I'm like. After all, I was still, like I was as a kid, prone to hiding my feelings. Being able to share my stories and feelings through writing was my way of trying to overcome the fear of expressing my personal self. So after college and after poetry, I graduated college with a degree in English, in poetry specifically. I continued to write poetry while I worked a day job that I didn't really like. Very abruptly after graduating though, I started to feel really sick all the time, like physically ill. I was constantly tired, my chest was always sore and I lost my appetite. It got so bad that I would cry myself into a stupor, hiding in the background in the bathroom at work for hours. Eating became physically painful and it felt like I couldn't swallow past a lump in my throat. I tried to see a doctor who sent me to another doctor who sent me to another. I didn't understand why nobody could help me. They always just sent me to someone else. I felt ill and I knew I was sick, but nobody could tell me why. Cut to the February after graduating college. I'm sitting on my couch eating pasta. I finish eating and it feels like someone punched me in my chest and I spiral into a panic attack. I call my mom and cry and keep asking her if I'm going to die. My partner Emmett comes over and I ask him if I'm going to die. I curl up on the couch and keep asking over and over if I'm going to die. I tell myself I can't ever eat a single scrap of food again because it's too painful and scary. My pant size went down multiple sizes in one month because I was too afraid to eat. I felt so small and weak. Anxiety, everyone said, Nina, you need to get over it. You need to get it together. I didn't think I could get it together though, because I felt so sick. So I s stopped writing, I stopped seeing my friends, and I started to hide again because I was scared. At the time, my partner Emmett and his friend Diego were making an iOS game together. I'd watch them work on it on the weekends when I would try and like, get out of my like, sick hiding spot in my bed. And I would sit there writing poems and listening to them talk about designing code. I'd always been interested in games and programming, and watching them do it made me want to try too. I was sick, but I needed something new and exciting, like games, to help me get through this rut. I knew I was ill and depressed, and I needed to change something. I started to tag along with them to any and all of the local games events. This was in New York City. I discovered games like Dysphoria and Kentucky Rat Zero at the time. Those games told stories, I thought, like my poems did. I started to teach myself how to code and began to make games based on my poems, just for myself. My mystery illness still held me back, though, um, which is why I was keeping them to myself, because I was just afraid to show people. But I didn't, go, I didn't give up. I saw potential in games as a new way of expressing my stories, and I didn't want to lose sight of that, especially when I was feeling so terrible. So soon enough, I found a doctor that diagnosed me with a stomach condition called gastroparesis. He told me that it had no cure, but I could do certain things to decrease the symptoms. I'd just have to learn how to live with it, he said. So that's exactly what I did. I struggled with depression and an eating disorder, but I also realized that my problems weren't going to go away if I didn't act. If I gained anything from my illness, it's that you can't hide, especially when you feel like everything in your life, even your own body, is crumbling. You need to seize every bit of inspiration bubbling up inside of you, and you have to fling your door open and tell the world that you're there. I left my illness behind and I made games. I made games like I made poems, small vignettes about my personal experiences. I'd watch people play these games about my life. I'd watch them embody my life experience. I saw that interaction and realized that it's the connection I'd always been looking for since I was a kid hiding in the attic. I'd felt sick and alone for so long. I didn't want to be alone, hiding. I didn't want to wither away with my illness. I wanted to be present and raw. I wanted people to see me, and I wanted people to see me in these games. I wanted people to embody me through my games, and I still want that and work for it in every personal vignette game I make. I want the player to come away from these personal games with a sense that they better understand my perspective or me as a person. 
I found that games are good for embodiment because they help the player actively engage with a character or story. I always strive to have the player actively engaging with the story as they play through these games as a way of putting them in my shoes. So freshman year is a game that I mentioned earlier. Um, and I think it's a good example of my effort to help players embody my life experience. Um, it's, as I mentioned, a game about a time I was sexually harassed in college. And I'll just show it really quick. Ooh, sorry. This one's longer, so I'm not going to play the whole thing, but I'll just show you so you have a sense of it. Maybe I should read it. You're sitting on your laptop in bed. You live in a dorm with your best friend, Jenna. She's not home. You're scrolling through a Facebook album of pictures from a party you went to last weekend, and all of your friends look totally wasted. You're glad that you didn't end up in any of the pictures. Hey, are you coming out tonight? Some of us are meeting up at that bar crawling. I'll pick this one. You look at Facebook and scroll through your newsfeed. There's a picture of you with Jenna. You're both posing with your hands on your hips, wearing tiny dresses. You stare at the picture and feel a little bad. Jenna is so much thinner than you. Okay, meet up in like an hour. Is anyone cool going to be there? Should I wear that new skirt? So the game kind of goes on like this. Um, and you're texting with your friend Jenna talking about going to this party at the bar um, and you're like pretty much down but you meet up with her and then this keeps happening so you're like walking to the bar and either Jenna is like with you and then she runs away or you go yourself and you're texting her but she like stops responding after a while but you, you are able to keep texting her so you're sort of like texting her being like Jenna where are you eh. and you kind of learn that the character me uh, is like anxious about going along to the party and then she like meets this bouncer who ends up being very aggressive uh, so that's what that game is kind of about and like. <sighs> so. right, let's put this back up okay so to continue my thought this freshman year is an autobiographical game, so truly there is one story with one ending. I don't want the player to have control over my life experience. It's mine, so they don't have to control it. I want them to embody me. I don't want to give them control. I want them to feel like they're me. Um, so I have to help them understand what my particular experience was like without them controlling or changing it. And you might be wondering how a player could embody a character that they can't control. So my job as a game designer um, that wants to sort of explore this idea of player character embodiment um, is to take my personal experience and craft out of it a game that helps the player play through the story and understand it and understand my feelings about it. So in freshman year, for example, you saw the text messages. So through the text message choices in freshman year, I'm able to help the player think about what the character is thinking and to try and bring them closer to her experience and perspective. Um, and especially when Jenna stops responding, it's very much like, look at your phone, look up, look at your phone. And it's supposed to kind of evoke that feeling of being very anxious as you wait for a friend. Um, so, let's see, Just checking time. Okay. So, let's see. The choices of the text messages are meant to help the player understand the character, not control the character. After all, I want them to embody me, not themselves. So... Later on, there's a harassment scene, and the player is unable to do anything. They're, like, reading a text message, and suddenly they're being, like, grabbed uh, by this man. So by taking away player agency during that, that harassment scene, I'm able to help bring them closer to my own experience of losing agency physically during this encounter. Um, and affecting player agency is another kind of design choice itself, and it can tell a story. Uh, and it's something... Uh, that I experiment with frequently, frequently in my work as a way of exploring embodiment. Um, so f freshman year, um, to sort of bring it back to what I was talking about with hiding and wanting to feel connected with people, um, 
freshman year helps me feel connected with people because I know that when they play it, they'll get to see things from my perspective just for a moment by embodying my experience. Uh, and the feedback to the game has been positive. And with every positive response, I feel a little more brave and a little more open to being honest about my life in games. It sounds selfish, but I think being selfish sometimes is okay. I want to know that people empathize with me. I want to know that for myself. I want to understand that they know where I'm coming from. So this kind of interaction with people playing my games and understanding me and then coming to me and being like, oh, I, I think I know what you felt like. That's what kind of empowers me to continue sharing my stories. I crave that back and forth. So, despite my intense anxiety about my diagnosis with an illness, and despite years of hiding my feelings from people, I pushed forward. I rode on the momentum I'd gained from starting to learn to code for games in 2012. I was invigorated by discovering the immense fulfillment I felt when watching people play my games, embodying my life experience. It felt like the only thing I had that might help me reconnect with the world after being sick, that might help me keep my life on track. So I threw myself into it. I'd barely made anything, but I was committed. So in 2013, I flew myself out to GDC with a bunch of medication and a few tiny games. I haven't stopped pushing myself ever since. I will make games about myself because it empowers me to continue making games and it makes me happy. There was once young Nina hiding in the attic, hiding in her computer room hiding in a theater, hiding with her illness. Now there's Nina who lives freely, telling her stories to people through play. I can finally express myself and speak and connect with people. I can be selfish and make games that are cathartic. The act of creating games that help people embody my life and empathize with me reminds me that I'm not alone. I can tell my stories and reconnect myself with the world. People will play and listen, and I don't need to hide anymore. That's it, thank you. Hi, um, it's not a question, but I want to thank you because I, I, I'm just sitting here and I realized that it's, it's a cathartic experience for you to make those games, but it also opens the door for a lot of people because it's a story you're telling, and it's an autobiographical story maybe, and may, we don't know it when we play it, but it's maybe, but it's a story that's being told, and only if those stories are being told, they are in the, the, it makes them valid to tell those stories. So I think it's very important to tell autobiographical stories. Um, and I want Thanks. to thank you for that. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's something I think about a lot. Um, and I talk with a lot of people about like, oh, like you make games about being like sexually harassed. People don't usually make games about that. Um, and it's kind of a nice like side effect that I can like show people that making games about these things is something that you can do sort of while also fulfilling my own desire to like make these games about myself to make myself feel better <laughs> um so yeah that's really nice of you to say thank you yes exactly it's just you you're telling the players that that is it's 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 a story that is worth being told and that is a lot thank you thanks Hey, <clears throat> well, that was loud. Um, yeah, I wanted to hear more about what you think of the nature of the games themselves. Uh, make them more empathetic to people, and then how... Wait, what was, you, what was it that you said before, empathetic? Uh, the nature of the games, and like bringing the poetry into the games and into their interaction. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and how, how you create the connection through there, and like create, because there are atypical kinds of games. But yeah, it's, it's just really, really fuzzy. <laughs> <laughs> it's glitched out. Yeah. You asked, how do I connect poetry into my games in a way that produces empathy? Sorry. Is that what you said? Just Thank you. We'll figure it out. Yeah, essentially. Yeah, that sounds good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, that's a good question. So I, I think that there is a lot to be explored when you use very specific, Ooh, oh no, are you okay? It's okay. Um, there's a lot to be explored with like very specific details. Like if you actually make real references to real things in your games, I think that that pulls people in more and like makes them feel like it's a more human story when they're like, oh, this is just about, I don't know, that park I went to once. Or like, oh, this is about a person and here are their friends with real names. Like those are kind of like my friends. So I think that drawing people in and like showing them that your game is really emulating a human experience is like using those real life details. Uh, and that's something that I learned in poetry. Cause like that poem I read from Ted Berrigan, like you saw it, it was talking about like where he went to get his pills and like who his friends were and like what they were doing. So I think using those real human life details helps with that. Cool. Uh, next talk. Sorry, but <laughs> we have to Lovely. move on. Thanks, thank guys. you, Nina. Yeah, thank you. Good job.